I've been wanting to learn more about laser engraving and cutting for a while, so when Longer offered me this Ray 5 10 watt engraving machine to try out, I took them up on the offer. While I have used a laser engraving machine before, I am very much a novice. I treated this like it was my very first experience with the laser. Everything arrived very well packaged with no parts missing. Hardware bags were clearly labeled for each step of the assembly. The assembly instructions were also easy to follow. All the tools that were necessary to assemble the machine were included. Before I assembled the frame, I made sure all the pieces of extruded aluminum were properly laid out. The left side Y-axis rail has a rear limit stop already installed. The right side does not. It's also important that on the X-axis rails, the flat sides face up. Each corner of the frame is held together with an L-shaped bracket and a hex head bolt. It's best to not fully tighten the set screws on the L-shaped bracket until the internal hex head is fully installed. Since these are steel bolts going into aluminum, I took care not to over tighten them. And once the corner bolt was fully in, I snugged down the set screws on the L-shaped bracket. Then I proceeded with the other three corners. Once the frame was fully together, the X-axis armature rolled right on. The two rear and the front right legs went on next. Then I installed the control unit on the front right corner. After I put in the Y-axis forward limit stop, it was time for the timing belts. The machine comes with the X-axis timing belt already installed, but the Y-axis ones need to be put in. The belts go in smooth side up and are carefully snaked through the drive gear. Without these timing belts properly installed, the servo would be unable to move the machine up and down the Y-axis. The end of the timing belt is fed through a little hole in the leg. The timing belts are then held in place with these little nuts that the instructions refer to as T-shaped screws. You place them on top of the timing belt then turn them 90 degrees clockwise. A screw is then inserted, and when it's tightened down, it will hold the timing belt in place. The T-shaped nut goes in kind of like a cam lock. Because of the shape, it will only go one quarter turn. The screw that's installed in the T-shaped nut will go down as far as it needs to to hold the timing belt. After I did a few of these, I noticed it was a lot easier to install the screw in the T-shaped nut first, and then it would lock in place on the first quarter turn. This is also how you set the belt tension. If the belt tension is too low, it'll sound like this. Notice how the gear is slipping on the timing belt? Properly installed, it will look more like this. The way these are designed, it'd be hard to get it too tight. The left and right side timing belts are both installed pretty much exactly the same. Next up comes the laser assembly. It goes in with two thumb screws on the front to allow for laser height adjustment. Two very small screws with nylon bushings get installed on the back to keep the laser riding snugly on its track. For the last assembly step, the wiring harness is connected. Given the way the harness is designed, it would be pretty difficult to connect them incorrectly, but they are labeled. Altogether, there are only three connections, one for each axis and the laser itself. For the final assembly step, a zip tie is used to secure the wiring harness to the X-axis armature. Before powering it up, I made sure I had good freedom of movement through both axes. To make sure that the laser is the correct height above the workpiece for optimal cutting and engraving, this little setup block is used like this. All you need to do is make sure the setup block fits between the laser and the workpiece and you've got it set to the correct height. At this point I was ready to turn the machine on for the first time. There's three different ways that you can operate the Ray 5. One of them is with a micro SD card which longer included a USB adapter for. It goes into a slot on the top of the control unit and includes a couple test files and software. The Ray 5 can also be connected and operated wirelessly, but to be honest, I haven't messed around with that and I'm not intending to. The third way to operate it is through a USB cable connected to a computer, and that's what I'll be showing a little later on. Before I connected my laptop, I decided to try out the test pattern cuts that are saved on the micro SD card. When operating it off the SD card, you can make changes to the settings through the control unit. The test engraving looked pretty good, so I decided to move on and connect my laptop. The SD card comes with two different kinds of software to operate the laser. One is Laser GRBL, which is a free program, but in my opinion, a little light on features. The other program is Lightburn, which is a high level of functionality and is free for use for the first 30 days. After that, a license is only $30. Lightburn can also be ran on both PC and Mac. When you first open up Lightburn, it will prompt to find your laser. I ran the automatic device discovery wizard, but this is what happened. 
Yes, my laser was connected and turned on. So then I read the instructions and did the manual setup. I clicked on Create Manually and then selected GRBL as per the instructions. Next I selected Serial USB. I renamed the device Ray5 and then I set the X and Y axes each to 400 millimeters, which is what their effective cutting distances are. Then I set the auto home point to the front left corner of the laser. With that done, I clicked finish. With the Ray5 now on my device list, I selected it and made it the default. I clicked OK and then I checked the COM connection dropdown. To my understanding, this means which USB port specifically the computer is using. The laser appeared to be connected, so I drew a simple shape to test that out. I clicked frame so I could see where the cut area would be. The Ray5 was indeed connected. Next, I wanted to do some test burns. One of the many things that a laser engraving machine like this is useful for for a woodworker is adding a maker's mark to a piece. I imported my logo, and as you can see, importing images in Lightburn is very simple. Next, I clicked the cutting tab so I could set the laser speed and beam strength. I adjusted them both to some recommended settings for this first test. I pressed the frame button one more time to make sure my plywood was in the right position. And with that looking good, I click start. To get an idea of how long these take, this initial engraving took about 8 minutes. The results were okay, but clearly my settings need some work. I cleaned up the test piece with the sander, and while it looked a lot better, I clearly needed more practice with this machine. To make orienting my test stock easier, I made up this little grid and then I burned it onto a piece of scrap OSB. I also downloaded a laser setting test file off Etsy. These can be really useful to determine the correct settings for a machine depending on what kind of material you're using. In my case though, this did not help. The Ray5 10 watt was way too powerful for the settings that were programmed into my test file. Clearly more practice was needed. I did a lot of tests, kept messing with the speed and power settings here and there, but what I found my biggest issue was is I was trying to do my tests on some really cheap crappy plywood. When I switched to the Baltic Birch, it looked a lot better. I started running tests on some walnut that I had. All of these samples were lightly sanded after the engraving to clean off all the smoke and residue that's produced during the burn. I plan on adding an air assist to this machine as soon as possible to eliminate that issue. I could definitely tell though that the Ray5 is great for engraving hardwood with the right settings. After doing wood, I played around with some other materials. First I did leather. Then I tried fake leather. Then I did anodized aluminum and a quarry tile, because why not? Glass wasn't a problem, though I did have to darken it first. I used a little bit of spray automotive paint primer and it came out just fine. I also tested the laser on some scrap from mica that I had, and again, it looked great. One thing I know that this machine can engrave that I wanted to try is silicone. I think the silicone sheets that I have were too thin because it just kept burning through. I also know that a lot of times with different materials, things like reflectivity and color do matter. This is where it's important to test materials till you get the right settings. Prior to getting the longer Ray 510 watt, I already had a laser engraver that could engrave just fine, but it wasn't powerful enough to cut, so that was something I definitely wanted to test. 3mm plywood proved to be very easy. This was done in a single pass. I also want to point out that I did buy an aftermarket honeycomb cutting surface, which is what you see underneath the machine right now. Something like this is pretty handy for cutting. It definitely protects your tabletop and makes for a more efficient cut. Here I cut through some 8mm plywood. I did it in two passes and I think if I had tweaked with the settings a little bit more I could have gotten the cut even cleaner. With all that I know I'm barely scratching the surface of the capability of this machine, but there are a few things I learned during the course of testing that I wanted to tell you about. One is it can get quite smoky, so good ventilation is important. Two, that laser is bright, so use the supplied eye protection. Lastly, this machine has two automatic shutoff features. One is a movement sensor, and if the machine is jostled, it will automatically turn itself off. I can vouch for the fact that this system definitely works. The other safety feature is a flame sensor. If the Ray 5 senses a flame, as in the piece is caught on fire, it will automatically turn itself off. However, I learned during testing that bright sunlight will also do this. The flame sensor is located on the back of the control unit and you want to make sure it is both unobstructed and not in direct sunlight to work properly. 
Overall, I'm pretty happy with this machine and I'm really looking forward to using it in a few projects that I'm going to detail in upcoming videos. I've included a product link in the description if you'd like to check it out. If you have any feedback for me or tips on how to use tabletop lasers with different kinds of materials and settings, please leave them in the comments. And as always, if you made it to the end, thanks for watching.